everybody. Thanks for coming back to the Strength and Leadership Podcast. I've got another great episode here with John Greaves of Garage Gym Life Media. If you've ever followed his channel or seen his videos before, you, you know that this guy is a, a true professional, extremely knowledgeable, former military veteran, just all around great person. Uh, I had a chance to be on his show uh, a few months back, and uh, so now it's my turn to interview him so as i had promised him so we're we're switching roles for today so john i appreciate the time man thanks for being on man this is great uh i told you when uh we talked i guess yesterday or the day before yesterday and uh, i remember you were asking me if i was ready and i said man you have no idea how relaxing it is <laughs> well maybe you do because i interviewed you but how yeah. relaxing it is to be able to just yeah. show up <laughs> yeah i don't have to really prepare for this like i've been studying about myself 47 years. Yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, a, it's a lot easier to, to come up with answers sometimes than to come up with questions. So, Man, um, yeah. But, you know, you had talked early on, uh, you were talking yesterday about early on in your, in your pathway of kind of how you started this. Can you kind of give me a, an idea on what got you into, you know, like, because your niche is very specific, right? Because you're running an actual magazine, and it's a digital magazine. So can you talk to me about what brought you into that niche? And how did you discover that there was a void there that you could meet? Sure. Um, so I've been working out from home since 2001. And uh, my first job out of college was a at a public gym, because I was going to be a reporter. So I was trained as a journalist. And then I did an internship with the local newspaper and I spent a summer um, of all things. The thing that broke me was I had to do a story on this special purpose, local option sales tax. And the idea was I needed to find out why they had not voted on it yet. So I said, like, okay, how hard can this be? Just go ask them, you know, they'll tell me wrong. These are politicians. Nobody wanted to give me a straight answer. So I spent like two months chasing these people trying to get a straight answer with my editor breathing down my neck and the politicians like being evasive. And I finally got, you know, some sort of, somewhat of an answer, but it was just crazy. And I said, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? And the answer is no. So um, I was working the front desk at the a local gym uh, while I was in my senior year of college. And so after I graduated, you know, I still had the job. I said, well, what am I going to do? And I was like, I enjoy working out. So that slowly turned into me, uh, first I was personal training, and then um, I got a promotion at the gym. And so I, I ended up being in charge of the weight room and all that kind of stuff. Well, when I left the public gym, because I had never, I've never had a gym membership in my entire life. Um, I went from working out at the school to working out at the gym where I worked. So I never had to pay for a public membership. And so I just couldn't do it. My, mentally, I was just like, I can't fathom giving somebody money to do something I've always done for free. And right. so I went and I bought some equipment and started working out at home. And I started having to adapt my workouts. And back then, this is nine, uh, no, like I say it's 2001, and magazines were still a big deal at the time. And so it was nothing for people to, you know, say, oh, well, like we didn't have coaches. It was unheard of to have like, a, like now it seems like everybody's got a coach. But back then, you didn't have a coach. At most, you might have a training partner. Um, and so, uh, most people, if they didn't really know how to put together their own workouts, they got that workout from the magazine. So that's kind of what I did, even though I had personal training experience, sometimes it's difficult to train yourself. And so I went and I'll get stuff from the magazines and I just noticed how I would have issues with adapting the workouts in the magazines to what I was trying to do and to my own, you know, to the equipment I had. So you see cable crossover. Well, I had two dumbbells in a box. I didn't have a cable crossover. This is in my loft apartment. I was like, what am I? So I had to figure out, okay, well, if I can do flies a certain way, I'll kind of get that contract, you know, that contracted position or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward, um, I, I wanted to get my writing career started. And, you know, I said, well, I'm going to freelance a little bit. And this is, and I, I got the urge to do that when I was deployed to Iraq, which would have been in 2005. And I said, you know what? Because um, so we're in Iraq specifically to take the city, to help take the city of Fallujah. So this is the second battle of Fallujah where we took the city. And so the first part of my deployment was in 2004 and I didn't have time for anything, right? Except shooting and not getting shot. 
So um, then after we took the city, things started to, started to kind of calm down. A lot of the people who were, a lot of the center of the insurgency moved to other areas. And so our area started to get more calm, so you had downtime. And so I started writing again, because I'm just bored. And came back to the States and I said, well, you know what, I'm gonna try this freelancing thing. Well, you gotta write about what you know about. And what I know the most about is, you know, working out at home. And so uh, at the time I was like, well, surely somebody is already doing this. I just haven't been able to find it. And the answer is no, really there wasn't. Um, Garage Gym Reviews really had just started their blog. Um, uh, GarageGyms.com was out there. But those were really the only two websites that were doing anything related to home gym, anything. Most stuff that you found was, again, in magazines, and they would say something like, you know, hey, if you can't get to the gym, here's a, you know, no weight workout you can do or whatever. It's like get two cans of soup and use that for weight or whatever, right? And so um, there was something that called itself a journal, but I ordered it, and when it came in, it was literally – uh, three sheets of paper in a Word document that had been printed out. And I said, I spent $50 for this. That's not acceptable. And so I started the pathway. That's when I started the path to try to put something like this together. I started as a blog and then, and I did that so I could start trying to attract writers, other writers, because you can't have a magazine with just one writer. That's not a magazine. And so I started, I, I, that's how I began the process of trying to attract writers to put together what became the Home Gym Quarterly. Okay. Uh, so once, uh, once you kind of found your, uh, your, your niche, I guess, what was the next process of trying to get uh, the, the Garage Gym Quarterly started? You know, was it, was it social media first and then you kind of went into that route or was it getting everything established for, uh, garage gym quarterly and then going through the social media realm? Um, we started with social media first and the, the biggest thing, if I had to do it again, I'm not sure if I would have done it this way, but I started out and I named, I, I named the, so, well, I guess technically we started by making it, uh, like coming with a name and because I happened to have a garage gym, I just called it garage gym life. And, um, and I thought it would be a good idea because like, even you look on my shirt, it says hashtag garage gym life. Well, I thought that that might work because at, even at the time, the garage gym life hashtag, it wasn't as popular as it is now, but it was, it, I think it had maybe 20,000 search results, 20,000 posts related to garage gym life. So I was like, okay, yeah, that's, yeah. Obviously there are enough people interested in that idea. And so I said, all right, well, we're going to call it garage gym life because I have a garage gym. This is my life. And so we created an Instagram and then when we um, incorporated, we incorporated Garage Gym Life LLC. But I never wanted to call the magazine Garage Gym anything because one of the things I noticed when you say Garage Gym is if somebody works out in the basement, they'll say, well, I don't have a garage gym, I have a basement. Uh, I don't have, uh, or I work out on my patio, does that count? You know, or whatever. Even Joe Gray has the garage gym competition. And every year I see this poor dude having to struggle through the same questions like, well, am I allowed to compete? I have, you know, I work out in my shed. I work out in my barn. I work out on my, in my driveway. My gym is in my spare bedroom. Yeah. And I'm just like, dude, why don't you just call it a home gym competition? <laughs> and he said, no. And he doesn't want to do that. And I get that too, because when people think home gym, they think of like, um, those uh, late night infomercial gadgets. It, it, I, I think of the exact same thing. It's like- uh, think home gym is like, home gym is like, I'm not serious yet, but garage yeah. gym, you're like, oh yeah, we're working. I'm like, look, I hear that. But the reality is, unless your garage is somewhere away from your house, you have a home gym, just deal with it. And, and I just, look, so that's why we decided to call the magazine Home Gym Quarterly because it's, um, uh, I had this thing like all written out. It's like basically spare bedroom, backyard, basement, uh, garage, shed, attic, driveway, uh, barn, and there was another one. But uh, I said, no matter where you work out, you're welcome. You're welcome here, right? And we have something for you. And uh, to be honest with you, each one of those locations has certain challenges and benefits that 
need to be addressed. And I think that we can best address with a magazine like ours. And so that was the other thing is like, all right, figure out who your audience is, uh, start attracting that audience with social media. And then um, also it, when you track that audience, figure out what they need. Because for example, I've never had an addict gym. I had a loft gym. That's what it was loft. So I, have, I had a loft gym because uh, I had a loft apartment. I've had a shed gym. I've had a, a single car and now it's two car garage gym. Uh, but I've never had my gym in a basement and I've never had my gym in a barn. And so, and then I've also never had my gym outdoors, except for when I was in Iraq, but that doesn't really count um, because I wasn't the one in charge of putting this stuff together. So for me to be able to write stuff that appeals to everybody in each one of those places, I have to know that one of the big concerns for somebody with a barn gym, for example, is when they say, hey, how do I keep this, you know, how do I heat this thing? If I tell them, oh, just, you know, just get a, a space heater they're going to immediately shut me out because a space heater can't cope with the high ceilings of a barn. Right. Right. And also let's think, let's talk about dirt. You know, you got barn doors. That means it's going to be a lot dirtier in a barn. So, which is going to affect some of your equipment maintenance, especially if you've got a lot of cable machines, you may not want to put cables in a barn because uh, your pulleys are going to get a lot more dust and whatnot in there than even in a garage. You know, if you have a basement, let's say you're somebody who has, um, there are people I know who have like, some emotional uh, issues that they fight, you know, people from my old unit uh, with PTSD and light is important for them. I would not advise someone like that to put their gym in a basement because you need to have access to natural light. If you got no choice, you got no choice. But I would typically advise somebody like that to put their gym in a garage because you can open the doors and you're going to get a lot of that natural light that's so important for you with your mood. And, and I mean, that's a serious thing. Mm -hmm. Having, if having light stops you from wanting to harm yourself, you need a garage gym. You know what I mean? Right. So that was the other thing. So that was the, ne the next step in it. Attract my audience, find out who my audience is, attract them, then find out what they need. And then the final phase will start to provide that to them. And then of course, let them know that, Hey, this is a resource that's out there. And that's where we are now. Letting people know that our resource is there available for them to check out for free. Yeah, it, it, that's one of the things that I, I really like about what you offer, not only with uh, your own uh, your own social media page, but the the quarterly magazine is it, it's not only is it free, but you uh, you touch on a lot of things that a lot of people don't don't think about, you know, and you cover a lot of things that maybe the average person may not either be aware of or get, you know, like you you touch on so many different places and so many different styles of lifts too. I mean, uh, I've seen a, a lot of the different articles that you, you've talked about. Um, it's not just all powerlifting. It's not, you know, it, it's, it's a really, I guess, healthy blend of just fitness, but training in the comfort of your own home, so to speak. And that's kind of what I see like with the, with the term like garage gym, like you said, everyone gets so uh, uh, bogged down in the minutia of the name garage gym, you know, like I'm down here in my basement and, you know, but I would consider myself part of that community. It's almost like the word Kleenex. Like everybody knows a Kleenex is a tissue, yeah. but everybody uses the name brand when there's right. a lot of different names out there. So, you know, like you said, if you are on, in a barn, you know, on your back patio in your basement, that's all considered, you know, within the same yeah. confines. So it's, um, but it's, and, and I've had conversations with other people about this, just, just the community itself is fantastic that, that I've experienced with and people, People are so willing, regardless of, of your own expertise and weight training, people are so willing to help you get along to the next level, and they're so willing to support yeah. you. That's one of the things that's really helped me, um, you know, within my own endeavors, you know, it's just figuring yeah. out um, what works and what doesn't, you know. How long did that take you to figure out, you know, were there some things that you tried early on, then you realized that this probably isn't the route that I want to go? and then you made a change? Yeah, um, there's, and this actually is also exacerbated by the fact that one of my personality quirks is 
I do not like doing what other people do. Um, and that can be to my detriment because what if, you know, if it's working, then you don't need to be different just to be different if it holds you back. Right. Right. So, uh, at a certain point I decided, so like we make this t-shirt. Okay. Um, but the main reason why we started making t-shirts is because I wanted, uh, number one, to motivate myself. And then number two, I said, well, if these things motivate me, I know that there are days when, I, I mean, again, I've been working out from a home gym since 2001. All right. And that's a long time. That's longer than most people I know who worked out mm -hmm. in a home gym. All right? That's a long time to do just one kind of exercise. Uh, but it's also just a long time to work out, period. And so there are days when you just don't feel like doing it in there. So sometimes, man, like this morning, um, I was telling my son before we got started, you know, I, I was tired last night because the, my, during my normal workout time, we were actually doing a Zoom conference for his school. So I worked out afterwards, but I was tired. You know, energy level just started dropping. So you know what? That's cool. We'll just we'll do what we got to do. And then that's that. Well, then I woke up at five o'clock this morning without planning to. I just woke up. And I said, well, hey, I got time. Uh, I had a chiropractor appointment at uh, 8.15. I said, look, I've got plenty of time. Let's do it. So I got up, came downstairs, finished the workout. Okay. But to be able to do that was kind of like, uh, let's find the right shirt. Because I don't want to just kind of go down there and go kind of mosey through it. I want to be able to attack this, right? So I grabbed a shirt, you know, it's like, uh, it says rebellious on it. It says hashtag rebellious. It's also a uh, shirt we used to sell. And I just, I put that on whenever I feel like I'm going against the grain. Like, ah, uh, you know, well, it's too, you know, all the things I, I'm thinking like, man, it's too early. There's no need to do this. You've had 20 years plus of working out <laughs> this one day of not getting everything done. You don't need to do it. I said, all right, put the shirt on rebellion. I'm rebelling. Let's go downstairs. Right. And so that's cool. But then people started, you know, some of the things that we had, uh, people started to show an interest in. And I said, well, man, I'm kind of limited because we do our stuff print on demand. Um, and so for people who don't know what that is, it's basically um, we have, we used to have spread shirt and now we use Teespring. You can also go cafe press threadless or whatever. And they'll basically make the shirt as people order it or whatever the thing is. Okay. Well, we wanted to expand. And so we had a business coach who said, hey, you know, the problem that you're running into is when somebody orders from Spreadshirt or Teespring, you don't capture their email information. And so you're like, you need to get these email lists because once you get the email list, they bought one thing from you. It'd be cool if you could then email that person when you come out with another item, with another product. Email them so that they'll know as opposed to you just having to put it out on social media and then you just have to hope that they see it because even if somebody has notifications on, on Instagram, it's, there's no way that if you turn notifications on, on Instagram, that you're still going to see everything that everybody puts out there. It's just not physically possible. Right. right? If you follow a hundred people and all 100 of them post that same day, especially at the same time, how would you see all those posts? Right? So anyway, so I said, well, so that, what do I need to do? And they said, do uh, email lists. So that means you need to create your own store on your website. All right, so I had to pay for that. Pay somebody to create our store. Pay to create the shopping cart. Pay for the plugin that makes all that possible to add this to the WordPress site. Then it's like, all right, well, how do we ship this stuff? All right, uh, shipping, for, for find a third-party fulfillment company. What that means is there are several companies uh, out there that will basically, they have a ware, giant warehouse. And your stuff is on, let's say if you have a small company, your stuff is on a pallet, one pallet, right? So anytime somebody orders, the shopping cart notifies that company to go get item 65C and they'll go pick it up off the pallet and they ship it to that customer, right? But at the same time, um, I need to you know, pay them for storing my stuff. Right. And so we had the choice of going that route, but I said, like, well, we don't make enough money yet to do that. So what do I do? Okay. Now we end up storing a bunch of stuff like this cup, right? We got these cups made when, back when people first started saying they wanted, um, 
these uh what you call uh insulated cups. Right. I was like, oh yeah, cool. All right. So they were kind of a new idea, and I and it, so it cost a lot more money to get that engraving done than it would now, right? But I couldn't put that on the uh, Spreadshirt website because Spreadshirt doesn't carry that. So I've got a mix of stuff that I can get print on demand. I mix of stuff that's already made that's sitting in my basement. Like, what do I do with it, right? So what it started happening is whenever somebody would place an order, we, my wife and I were physically fulfilling these things, trying to get to the point where we could earn enough money to afford a third-party fulfillment service. And that was a nightmare. I still remember when, for some reason, we got something wrong. It was something very small uh, in terms of on our end, but it made the shipping cost for products like $30 for a shirt. Well, the shirt cost $30. So now somebody owes sixty dollars to just buy a shirt, yeah. and uh, you know somebody let me know they're like, "Hey, this good guy uh, Ryan De Pompeo, working class, uh, he's at Working Class Beats." He yeah. said, "Man, I want to buy this shirt, man, but I don't see why it costs so much money to ship something. You know, costs thirty dollars to ship something. To me, I'm right here, in, you know, in the Chicago area." And I was like, "What are you talking about?" I go check and I see it. We got that wrong. So we ended up having to uh, just eat that cost and just we took that part of the website down got rid of it. It doesn't even exist anymore. But that was the lesson I learned. It's like, look, just because you, there's a possibility of improving by doing things a little different, differently, um, doesn't mean that it's right for you. And what seems to be right for us is to just, if somebody's interested in our apparel, I just send them to the Teespring store. Hey man, you guys fulfill it. Especially since, uh, to go back to the whole pitfalls of this thing, I had to ship something. I shipped one of those cups I just showed you to a guy in Germany. We've since day one, we've had people around the world who've been fans of our brand because they're home gym owners around the world, right? This guy's in Germany. He said, "Man, I love that. I want to get some. Let me get that cup." And we had some socks. He said, "Oh yeah, send the cup and the socks." All right, cool. He said, "I pay for it." He pays for it. I go to the UPS store to ship it out, and that's when I found out that it was going to cost me seventy dollars mm. just to ship this cup in these socks because of the cost of shipping and the size of the thing is on, uh, so forget it. So now if somebody in Australia wants to buy something and I'm asleep, they can go on Teespring and they can order the thing and it'll be made in somewhere that's close enough to them to not cost them an arm and a leg for shipping. Right. And so that was like a lesson learned. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I, I've come through some of my own similar problems and, and, but without those, uh, without those mess ups, it's hard to, uh, I guess, appreciate the amount of work that's required to get things right. Oh yeah. You know? And, uh, it, it definitely becomes easier as you go through things and finding that, finding that niche has, has, I think that's almost, that's, that's almost the entire struggle, I think, is finding that specific group of people because it's the old business model, right? Uh, um, what is it? Uh, 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers, yeah. right? Yeah. And so yeah. you, you, you need to appease that 20% because those are the ones that are going to keep coming back for, you know, to, to either buy the shirt or to, uh, um, obtain your content or, 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 you know, whatever the case may be. So you find out real quick that, uh, that, that 20% becomes really, really important because they're the ones who are then going to expand your brand onto other people. So, um, yeah, well, it, the other thing about that too is like, okay, so it's 20% of your customers, but you have to kind of define your customer because yeah. for us, customer also includes readership. So there is a segment of our target audience that will cheerfully read our every word that's in our magazine, but they don't want to buy even one shirt because they have other brands that they're just more into. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you have other people who would, you know, Hey, I like that shirt. Oh, uh, let me, you know, I like that shirt. I like that shirt. I like that shirt. Right. But they're not interested in reading the magazine. And so when you have sort of like a diverse, um, so we're product slash service and we don't, it's not just one thing you have to then figure out, like you have to, so you find yourself appealing to multiple groups 
And it even affects how I, so Instagram is marketing. No matter what people tell you, it's, it's marketing. It's a marketing tool, right? And so I find that the way that I even post things on Instagram has to appeal to different people. I can't just make a post and say, this is the post. Instead, I say, okay, well, who is this intended to appeal to? And I'm finding that maybe I need to even say, all right, so people who are going to buy something from our apparel store are more likely to respond well to that sort of post uh, at this time of the month because, you know, it's near payday. Whereas somebody who just wants to know about like what I think, uh, so like a, like an information post. So like I made the post about the fact that I think you should have a safety squad car. Um, there, there are a lot of people who want that. Well, they may not be, they may not want to hear that on a Monday. They may want to hear it because a lot of people don't start their week squatting on Monday, right? So that may be a good post for Wednesday. Right. Or Thursday afternoon. You know what I mean? So it's like you're constantly, and then the thing is, again, like I said, Instagram, because of how it, it works, people don't always see stuff when you put it out there. So they may not see it until later, depending on what kind of hashtags you use and whether how it, people respond to it. So it's affecting how I like decide which posts to promote, which posts to just uh, put out at whatever time. There's a lot that goes into it. it. There really is. And that's one of the things that I've slowly started to figure out, uh, especially timing is everything. Timing is so important and getting yeah. the, getting the right, uh, the right content out at the exact right time is if you get one right, man, it's, it can really blow up, but, uh, and can really make an impact. But if you don't, then there's a, there's a big struggle, but, um, I, I do. I, I, we were talking about this yesterday and I, I didn't want to forget it. So as you were, uh, as you were writing, um, I had a conversation with uh, Mark Bell in one of my previous episodes and, and we were talking about Mark a, a little bit yesterday. Um, yeah. And he is, uh, I mean, he is like the most down to earth, very humble, but yet he doesn't forget his own upbringing, his own past, the way people, you know, kind of talk to him in your experiences. Cause you said that you, had some interactions with him and his team and, and uh, you've had some chances to interview some pretty high profile guys. Can you, can you kind of talk to me about your experience with that? Sure. So um, I did a couple of uh, articles for some websites just cause I wanted to kind of get, so the way that freelance writing works is you, you come up with an article idea and then you send it into an editor. And you say, hey, are you interested in a story, an article about this, whatever it is, right? And typically what you want to do is uh, you, you're going to just, for anybody who wants to send something to my magazine or just in general, make sure you've read enough of that publication so that you know whether they just wrote something about that, right? Because that's a very quick way to get your stuff put on what they call the slush pile, meaning I'm not going to be reading this at any time. I won't even know that you sent it in. I'm just going to toss it, right? So um, I wrote a couple of uh, stuff uh, pieces for some websites just about stuff I wasn't even really interested in because I wanted to um, sharpen my interview skills and also my ability to pitch articles. And then the funny thing about it is that, that I didn't use any of that experience to get my article, my first article accepted by Power Magazine. I literally just called Super Training Gym one day. <laughs> And the guy uh, who was one of his co-hosts on the Marco Powercast, this was the show he had at the time, I used to watch it all the time because I liked the way that they interviewed people. They put people at ease, they kept it light, but you still got a lot of information on this stuff. So I used to watch it every Monday. I was like, all right, I'm going to watch it. I'll be on the treadmill or something to watch it, right? So I call and this guy answers the phone and I recognize his voice. I said, oh, is this is Mike? It was a guy, a silent Mike. I said, Mike? And I said, silent Mike? He said, yeah. And I said, hey, um... I told him who I was. I said, look, um, I want to write for your magazine. I promise you, you, give me, you guys give me a chance. I'm probably going to be the best writer that you've ever got. All right. And I, with that very humble introduction, he's like, oh, well, that's good, man. I said, and, and the reason I said that, is I said, um, I said, I'm not saying that I, I have more knowledge than anybody else, but 
I look at your publication and I think that you need somebody who can interview people and I'm able to interview anybody and to help them tell their story in a way that nobody else you guys know right now is able to do. And I knew that because I read the magazine. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, here's a hole right here. They don't have really interviews with people. What they had was a bunch of articles from people who are experts in the field. So there were a bunch of training articles. What they didn't have was interviews with people who have um, become successful in lifting. And I said, all right, you have that on your PowerCast. You don't have that in your magazine. So it's ob it seems to me that you're probably interested in stuff like that, but you don't have anybody that knows how to do it or else you'd have it in there. Boom, here I am. Okay. So I took that. Um, my first interview was with a guy that I just happened to know. Uh, who's a bench press world record holder. His world record still stands. He's 130 pounds and he had a 400 something pound bench press. Mm. So I was like, all right, let me, uh, you know, let me go ahead and, uh, and interview him. I did. It. And then my next interview was with um, Steve Goggins, who is who went on to become a powerlifting coach, my powerlifting coach. But Steve Goggins was um, the first man in the single ply era, not multi ply. Not you see guys doing it now in multi ply, meaning there are multiple layers of equipment for them, right? What Steve was using uh, was the same thing that Ed Cohn was using. And in fact, Steve and Ed went up against each other multiple times, um, and a lot of times Steve won, sometimes Ed won, but uh, Steve was the first man to squat 1,102 pounds. And the funny thing is he did it in the same meet. So he's, he broke the world record the all time. And I don't mean like this is like for his weight class. I mean like nobody had ever squatted that much weight before at all at any body weight. And he squat. So he broke that record. It was like a thousand something. Right. And then on his third attempt, he did 1102. And the funny thing is that he actually beat uh, God, what's the guy's name? This Andy Bolton. He was in the, it was in the same meet with Andy Bolton and he beat Andy Bolton because Steve weighed, you know, on total, they, their totals were the same and Steve weighed less. And so Steve beat Andy Bolton in that meet. Uh -huh. So, um, I went, I interviewed him and the thing about it is a lot of people that never heard of Steve because powerlifting USA no longer existed. Mm -hmm. And as I said, you know, the only powerlifting magazine was Power Magazine, and they weren't really doing interviews. So a lot of people had never heard of Steve. And a lot of the older guys, man, they had started getting the feeling like nobody cared about their legacy. So when I approached him, he was like, yeah, I'll be happy to, you know, whatever. So I, I go to his house, and he had a home gym, and I, so I filed that away. And <laughs> then we just started, you know. <laughs> and, I, and so uh, I interviewed him, and so he got – this actually really touched me because he was so excited. This is a guy who's been all over the world lifting broken records. He knows everybody that is at the top of the lifting world in terms of powerlifting, right? And, and they know him. That's even more important. It's not just who you know, it's who also knows you. They know him too. And this guy was so touched by what I did that he took the article and had it blown up. So it's dang near my height. <laughs> and he put it <laughs> up in his living room <laughs> so i went up he said yeah go upstairs check this out i went upstairs and then someone went over there and i saw i said oh my god and that actually motivated me to start doing the same thing with my i didn't make him that big but i also printed out some articles so if you come to my house you go up the you either go up the stairs or down the stairs there are a list of some of my articles from power magazine either even one from an old newspaper article i did um and you can see them as, as you're walking in the house. They're on the right-hand side. It's like a, a list of these. Not a list, but um, they're printed out and then mounted on like that foam back, mm -hmm. foam backing, whatever. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so that one guy who I interviewed, uh, Zahir Kodaev, was very popular at the time. Um, uh, so his middle name, I'm sorry, his last name is spelled K-H-U-D-A-Y-A-R-O-V. And he is, he was the first um, uh, lifter from overseas who I interviewed. So that actually was kind of the thing that made uh, the guys at Power Magazine kind of look at me with respect because they were like, how do you even have access to this guy who's from Russia? Like he's a rush, he's, I mean, he's not Russian, but he's, he's, a, he's uh, lives in Russia. He's, you know, he's, Wife is from Finland. He lives in he lives in Russia and Flint, Finland, right? His command of English is not the best. How do you have contact with this guy? And what happened is, I uh, I was competing in powerlifting at the time, and I went to a meet, 
And after the meet, um, we got back home and I had promised a guy who I knew that I was going to go support him at his meet. So I went to his meet and it, and his meet was a world's meet. And Zahir was there just watching. So I got there and I meet Samantha Coleman, who I also ended up interviewing. Samantha is a world record holder in, um, uh, in powerlifting. She's also a very accomplished, uh, strong woman competitor, right? But anyway, so I met Samantha Coleman. Somebody introduced me to Samantha, right? So we're talking and then she introduced me to Zahir. And I said, uh, cause I'm like, this dude is from overseas. When am I ever going to talk to him again? Right. Yeah. We're talking and the two of us are helping the guy that we all mutually knew lift, right? Like running up, handling him, giving him ammonia, all this stuff. Right. And I said to Zahir, I said, Hey, uh, so has anybody ever interviewed you for any magazines? He said, no, he said, no, nobody ever talks to me. I said, hmm. I said, I, can I interview you? And he said, <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm home. He said, well, how will we do it? He said, I'm flying back home. I said, you let me worry about that. All right. I said, I'll, t- I'll figure out a way. And then I immediately, I'm like sending a message out. I said, Hey, do you want me to, can, can I, are you interested? This is like the shortest pitch ever. You want to interview with Zahir could I if I can do it. And they said, how do you even have access to him? Like I got a message back, like immediately, like, how do you even have access to him? I said, don't worry about who I am. Okay. <laughs> 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 I literally would just happen to just be sitting there with him. Yeah. And so we worked out a deal because I was like, man, I got to research this dude. And so what I ended up having to do was I emailed him the questions. His wife got the questions and she took him to somebody to translate them into their language. Uh, Russian was like what he's going to be most comfortable in. He tra- they translated the questions in Russian. He answered the questions in Russian. They took him back to the translator. The translator translated back into English. They emailed me the English version. And we went back and forth like that for four weeks, emailing back and forth until we got the thing around. Then I sent it into Power Magazine. And that, so that was my, that's actually on my, uh, my wall also. And um, they ate my, it up. Oh man, they're like, how do you, like they still, to this day, they probably don't even understand. I never told them. <laughs> <laughs> how do you even have access to them? And I guess they were just like, well, heck, he knows Steve Goggins. You know, maybe he just is one of these guys you never, there's so many power lifters who are good, who you never really hear of. They're like, well, maybe he's just somebody that we've never really heard of. And he's just kind of sort of embedded there. Like one of these mid-level lifters. Maybe I, I guess that's what they thought I was. And they're like, all right. Um, I ended up interviewing Dennis Cornelius because I had a, uh, I was training. So like I said, a lot of people knew Steve, no Steve. And so I, I was lifting at his gym one day and a guy, Perry Ellis came in and I ended up helping to spot Perry. Well, then Perry went to USAPL Nationals, and while there, I see him stand. He posts a picture on Instagram of himself standing next to Dennis Cornelius because Dennis Cornelius was in the same meet. And Dennis Cornelius is a—I mean, that's a, a stud. And I said, "I said, I know you told him to let me interview him, right?" <laughs> and Perry was like, "Oh yeah, sure, of course we did. I knew that was a lie, but because I made, had a conversation, Dennis Cornelius sees the—you know—he's tagged in it, and he said, "Hey, yeah, man, hit me up anytime. Cool." I sure will. <laughs> hey, anybody interested in the interview with Dennis Cornelius? I can do it. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And that's how I interviewed him. And then all of a sudden, man, you've got all the connections just like that. <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah. This dude knows everybody. Yeah. How did you know all those people? <laughs> Last week, that didn't seem to be the case. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like hilarious. <laughs> I was in the animal cage. I-, I used to be part of the Animal Barbell Club which is basically just something that animal universal nutrition put together for the animal brand. So it was a, a group of lifters from again, all around the world. Um, and that actually gave me the idea for like the garage in life in a way, like you can connect people around an idea. Mm-hmm. It's at the time it was like all, a message board. Well, we would once a year, we'd get together at the Arnold and we would all just go and lift. And we, after we lift, we'd eat. And then, so they said, well, you can have, they had like these coordinators, these state coordinators, right? So I became the Georgia coordinator. And so that meant that I put together um, seminars and whatnot. And so the animal athletes would come sometimes and be guests for, right? Well, because of that, I walk in, you know, I could go into the animal cage. People would know me and they're like, oh, hey, John, you know, whatever, right? Like, uh, oh, they called him Gun Rock. Like, hey, Gun Rock, you know, whatever. And so Dan Green, I don't know if, who, if you're familiar with him, but Dan Green was a very high level lifter uh, around, you know, um, 2013, 2014, 2015, something like that, right? Dan, I mean, like he's at the top of the heap. And so his wife is like, she sees me in the animal cage and I'm talking to these guys 
and I, who some of whom I know because I know Steve, some of whom I know because just I'm an animal barbell club, you know, coordinator. And she literally just wants to say, who are you? <laughs> like, why do you know these people? <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, so I'm not. This is the other side of John that I wasn't aware of. <laughs> like, she walks up, she's like, seriously, I don't even, I don't know who you are. Why does everybody else who I know, know you? Yeah. Who are you? Right? <laughs> like, I mean, I'm literally walking in and I'm shaking hands with people. Like, you know, like you walk in the room and it's like, hey, who's this guy? And like, I'm, hey, how you doing, man? You know, like, Hey, how you doing? How you doing? And she's like, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Like, yeah. It's pretty what, cool. And I love that. That's an uh, amazing story because that you show some, you show some, uh, I guess, um, perseverance, but also there's a lot of courage there, you know, by just calling up power magazine and just saying hey i can do this and here's why you know how many people are are not willing or not confident in their own abilities to do that you know and and that sets you up for so many more opportunities you know and, and yeah. that's a part of what um i guess you could say i'm trying to uh, trying to expose to show people that you know you need to take those chances because had you not taken that chance you know, it may not have put you down the path that you're on now. It could have taken you a completely different oh, yeah. path, you know? And, oh, yeah. and and that's what I love hearing about, you know, the stories like that is is the confidence and the and the, the courage to, to go and do that. And to you seem like you were very cerebral in the sense that you knew an opportunity was happening in the moment of the opportunity and you seized it. You know, and I, I think that's what's so what's so critical is, uh, you know, the so, so many times like we'll look back and, and we might say, man, that was an opportunity I missed or, you know, I wish I would have done it this way or if I had done it this way, something better might have happened. And you seem to have just almost like go for broke each and every time. You know, yeah. and and I think that's what's that's what's so cool about about those stories, and and it's really set you up to to meet and connect with people that you know any of us for that matter may, may not have known. You know, right. um, but that is it is funny though because I, I think my wife would be the same way. You know, I'm I'm having conversations and starting to talk to people as well, and. And she might be the same, you know, I would tell, tell her, Hey, I'm going to interview this guy. And she's like, okay. You know, and it's, 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 it's the completely different world of, of yeah. what, you know, of what they're used to. And, and not that there's nothing wrong with that, but it, um, you know, it's, it's always a neat thing, you know, because we all want to be a part of something, you know, bigger than our ourselves, I guess. And, and that's the, I go back to it, but that's the one thing that I love about the fitness community is that, you everybody's regardless of race religion creed whatever everybody goes around the same commonality of everybody's helping the other person try to better themselves and that, yeah. that that's in the weight room man you know and it's it doesn't matter and and people don't put each other down it's nothing but support and that's what makes it so great you know yeah i mean so there's a several things about me that I guess may mean like, so God has designed me to do this thing, right? Um, <clears throat> number one, I'm not scared of people. And what I mean by that is I spent a long time just being afraid, apprehensive of like people, like what people would think about me, um, being just intimidated all the time. And part of that comes from the fact that I came to the United States when I was very young. And so, um, I had a different accent. Even I, I mean, I spoke English just fine, uh, but <laughs> that's actually led to a that's a, sort of a tangent story. But um, I spoke English just fine, and um, and all that. But I had a different accent, and so I had a lot of people who were just you know it's different, it's strange. I said this is 1980s, and I spent a long time intimidated, and then I started to take martial arts, and I wouldn't say that learning martial arts helped me. It's the fact that 
I was very, I'm still very loyal to my coach. And I remember the day that <laughs> he said, uh, hey, uh, I come in and he said, hey, we need you, I need you to fight. I said, okay. Um, and what was in my head was like, you know, so I'm, it's like we had a bunch of black belts and then me. So I'm fighting these guys, you know, every weekend we're sparring. This is like mixed martial arts and mixed martial arts wasn't big yet. So I'm sparring these guys and I'm just getting beat all the time. So you kind of like start to lessen your fear of fighting people when I know I'm like, all right, whoever I fight here isn't going to be as good as the people who I spar every weekend. I'm like, well, you know, whatever. So some of the intimidation factors started to go down, right? And so he said, say, I need you to fight. And I said, fight? I said, yeah, sure, fight who? And he said, the school, <laughs> it's like a kung fu movie. He said, the school across the street or I mean, uh, across town challenged us. Over Kai? Said, yeah. I was yeah. like, are you serious? <laughs> I said, that actually happens? He said, oh, yeah. And then he said, man, people call here all the time because they'll like call and say, literally one dude called and was like, um, so you know what trapping is? Trapping is what happens in Kung Fu. You see in a, in a, I mean, not for my phone. So you see in the Kung Fu movies, what happens is they'll like block and then do like that. Yeah. Right? So it's like that or like that or like that or whatever, right? Because that's trapping. Well, uh, the Kung, Wing Chun Kung Fu, which is the most popular form, but you also have Wushu as well. Anyway, so they do a lot of trapping, right? So it's always stop the stop whatever you're doing and then I try to hit you, right? And so if you watch one of the old school punk Kung Fu movies, there's trap, 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 hit, right? And <laughs> so apparently somehow or other the word got out to the school that my coach, because we were we were incorporating in, in the Chattanooga area, we're the first ones to incorporate boxing with, mar with uh, Eastern martial arts. So if I throw a jab at you, you're not going to be able to do all this stuff, right? You're going to get your eye dotted while, you know, you're like, and then you still be doing this, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so somehow the word got out to them that we supposedly said, hey, you know, uh, you can't trap a jab. So they called the school and they said, hey, we hear that you're saying that what we're teaching is a lie and that we can't trap a jab. And my coach isn't going to back down. He was like, I don't think I said that. He said, now, I may have said you can't trap my jab. I probably said that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> all right. So that didn't help the situation at all. <laughs> anyway, so we end up, we're going to we go and we, I think we had like maybe three weeks and we went. So that was my first fight in the ring. Never fought in the ring before. I get in the ring and, uh, man, your heart is about to jump out your chest, right? I wasn't wearing a shirt. So it's just like, but it's just like, I said, I know they could see my heart beat yeah. across the dang room. I was the second fighter up. I said, all right, I mean, there's a whole bunch of circus going on with this, right? Because I was a bouncer at the time also. Like I said, confidence was up. And so some of the guys I knew from bouncing came, and apparently they, the whole reason this, these people thought this was a good idea because apparently they had a professional wrestling promotion as well as a martial arts school. So they decided to promote this like a wrestling thing. And the guys who bounced with me were – in their wrestling promotion. So they're like, hey man, look, we're on your side. We can't say anything because we work for these people. But hey, go in there and knock them out. So okay, yeah, <laughs> great, yeah. No pressure. Yeah. So I go in there. I go in there and my coach is like, hey, what you're gonna do is this all relates back to the thing, I'm, I promise you. So then my coach says, all right, so I'm wearing boxing gloves, right? And you know, um, boxing gloves, you, the thumb is attached. So you can't really grab stuff. He says, you're gonna intimidate him. What I want you to do is grab the top rope. And you're gonna jump over the top rope into the ring. I said, like, uh, we 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 haven't we haven't practiced that. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> that's not something we've gone over like ever. I've never I don't I don't do that. He said, yeah 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 you're fine. Here I got this robe made. So now I put on this robe. I'm starting to feel like Apollo Creed. This is not gonna work. Uh, this went bad for the last dude. <laughs> like dude that wore a robe and got in the ring. I don't I don't like that. <laughs> so I put the robe on. I go out there. Oh god. And then. I get my hands on a rope. It's slippery. And I like grabbed the rope and I jumped over it. Um, and it slips out from under me a little bit. So I land and I kind of play it off and I spin like, so I look like Ric Flair now. I'm yeah. like this. <laughs> but really I'm trying not to fall down. <laughs> I, my heart is even worse now. I said, they can see my heartbeat. I know they can. <laughs> and, I, and I'm just like, yeah, like that. Cause I'm terrified. Fight starts and I, I hit the dude and he drops and Everybody's surprised, including me. Uh, yeah, I'm like, I hit him. He drops him like. <laughs> I get yeah. my stance, like, 
Is that it? We're done? Right. Yeah, that's it, right? So my coach is yelling. He's like, hey, start the count. The guy who's like, was the referee was actually like the master, the grandmaster of their little martial arts school. I don't know how, who elected him the referee, but he's the referee. And he's looking at his guy. And my coach is like, you plan on starting the count? What happened to the count? And the guy's like, he said, my coach just said, I'll do it for you. So he's counting. And he said, yeah, 19, 20. This is supposed to be a 10 count. The guy's like, it ain't 20. So he starts counting. Anyway, the, the whole fight is over at the minute 44 second mark. But in between then and, and the end of the fight, you know, when you're knocking him down at the end of the fight, there's arguing back and forth. Again, at least people like professional wrestling people. So they're like jumping up on the stage. Like they're going to come in into the, like the ring. Like they're leaning over the ring ropes. Like they're going to come in. My coach is not a professional wrestling guy. So he thinks they really want to fight. So he climbs in the ring like, all right, let's go. So I'm standing there. So I guess we're going to fight some more. All right. <laughs> my mom, <laughs> my stepmom is in the audience. And uh, it's hilarious because she's like, after this is all over, she said, is it always like this? And I was like, <laughs> I don't know. This is our first time ever doing this. <laughs> all right. So that's always in the back of my mind. Whenever I have a situation come up where I have to like approach somebody, I'm like, well, look, this person may be whatever they are, but they've not done what I've done. You know, to them, if I tell them my stories, like I'm sure there's somebody watching this or listening to this who hears this story, and if they picture themselves in the same situation, they're like, man, that's just nuts. That sounds like the craziest thing ever. And to me, that was just, it's just part of my story. Yeah. So I know that anybody who I approach has to accomplish something in some area, but they haven't necessarily accomplished what I've accomplished. And so what I do is, I don't put people on a pedestal. Instead, I just assume that we're roughly equal. They've just accomplished more in the field that I want to talk to them about mm -hmm. than I have. But I always say, well, if they had to come interview me about what I've done, I'm like, well, look, dude, I got a combat action ribbon. I was silver medalist uh, at nationals, uh, International Kickboxing Federation Nationals. Um, whatever you want to, I'll keep going until I find something you haven't done that I've done, <laughs> right? So it right. makes it so that I don't feel like I'm David and you're Goliath. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. And so that's like the biggest thing for me. And then as far as the fear thing goes, I'm just like, well, hold, can it be worse than some of the stuff you've gone through? Is it worse than sitting in a cubicle doing insurance, uh, doing insurance claims and having somebody call you up 50 calls a day, at least people cussing you out. Like it's your fault that they were in an accident. I was like, I wasn't even there. How yeah. were you mad at me for <laughs> Is it worse than that, that your life slowly leaking away, being kind of like sucked or sucked dry while we're arguing all the, me and the other claim reps jockeying for position because whoever is like the favorite person gets to sit by the window and be able to look outside. Mm -hmm. So is what am I going, what I'm about to go do is that, that worse than slowly dying every day there, you know, for five years when I worked for that insurance company? No. Then the answer that's no, <laughs> no, yeah. it's not. It, it that reminds me of uh, one of my favorite movies, Shawshank Redemption, and uh, yeah. the, fam the famous line that Tim Robbins says as uh, as he's playing Andy Dufresne, you know, get busy living or get busy dying. And uh, I mean, there's so much truth to that, you know. And it's like as the the older that I get, the more I I feel like I appreciate that. And the more importance it is to uh, try to make things a little better than they were the day before, you know? So I've, I've right. been listening and reading a lot about what Jordan Peterson says. And I think that I had touched on it briefly when, when we had talked last time, but you know, the idea of, of everybody has to bear some burden, you know, we're all suffering in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And there's no 100%. point to, there's no point to, to, to play the victim. Our jobs as humans are to bear our own individual burden and to try to make life a little bit better than the day before. 100%, 100%. Yeah. I mean, you got to always, that's the other thing too, that makes it um, two things that make it very important to me to continue doing what I do um, because so we've done so many things with Garage in Life that nobody else was doing. When we started doing this thing on Instagram, um, I didn't really think my life is very interesting. I know that sounds crazy because the story I just told you. But <laughs> I, I just don't feel like my day-to-day -day life is very interesting. A lot of the things that make my life interesting are 
related to stuff that happens because other people come into my life. Mm -hmm. But my normal life is just, I just sit, I like, I want to get up, sit in the house, read a book. That's it. Right. And so I was like, well, you gotta have something to put on Instagram. And so I started, um, there was a way to, I realized it was a way to repost. And so, uh, people were reposting at the time what famous people were doing. Nobody was really reposting what a normal, average, ordinary people was doing, uh, person was doing. And so I would do that. And that's how we grew our Instagram from when we first started up to 3,000 by simply reposting what other ordinary home gym owners were doing. And we were the first ones to say, hey, home gym ownership is, is worldwide. So instead of just focusing on what happens in America, let's repost people from Australia, whatever. And so now I've got people all day, all night, because of different time zones, looking at what I'm doing. Hey, he mentioned my name, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized how much people respond or how much people need their stories told. And the other part of it is that also gives me confidence, going back to the other thing about talking to strength athletes, especially, is strength athletes tend to be very um, introspective. Uh, yes. Um, even the ones who are very good at social media, uh, still, if you actually talk to them, they end up, they almost seem shy. Because to be very good at anything physical, you have to be in tune with your body to a, the extent that you, you block out a lot of the outside world. Mm -hmm. And so they tend to be very introspective, which makes it sometimes difficult for them to tell their story. So you go to Michael Jordan and say, hey, how do you dunk? He can't teach you. He can show you how he does it. Because he's so in tune with his own body that he doesn't really know how to tell you to do it because he doesn't even really know how to put that into words, right? right? And so you see like the reason why Michael Jordan is famous is because other people come in and they tell his story for him. Or they ask him a question and it slowly draws it out. And so that's the other thing is like, I, I firmly believe that people need this service that they don't even necessarily know is a service that I provide. Because they think that they're getting everything from social media when the reality is, as I said in a post recently, social media is set up to show you more of what you already know and like and have followed in the past, which means that the answer to something that you need and you may not even know you need exists outside your field of vision, right? right. So uh, let me use a different uh, uh, sort of a example outside of fitness. Part of the reason why um, the quiver was created was because it kind of gets tiresome carrying a bunch of arrows, right? The reason why arrows were created is because, you know, a spear is too heavy to throw far. And if you throw just one spear, you might not kill that thing. You might want to shoot multiple things, especially if there's only one of you. So people, you go from the throwing stick to the bow and arrow. You start shooting arrows, right? Well, again, you got multiple arrows. It's hard to carry these arrows in just your hand. You create the quiver. And why do you do that? Because that first arrow might break or you might just lose it. So you gotta have a bunch of arrows with you. All right, in Australia, I've looked and I may be wrong about this, but they don't have a quiver because their solution to the problem was to create something you could throw that comes back to you. So missing is not a problem with a boomerang. Yeah. So the solution to the, a similar problem was solved in two different ways. So the Australian Aborigines or native Australians probably could have used the idea of the bow and arrow because you could shoot a bow with a lot more force and power than you could throw a boomerang. Right. And the people who created the bow and arrow could have used the idea of something that you throw that comes back, right? But neither one of them could see the solution because it was over the horizon, mm. outside of their field of vision. Okay, we exist in that same world now because the solution to your hip problem might have been solved by that person who does pole fitness or yoga, aerial yoga in their home, but you will never know because you don't hang upside down from stuff. You squat and bench. And so while you're steadily buying gadgets to open your hips up, they're over there doing this thing. They're like, oh yeah, well, we just do this. We got a little block. <laughs> and we, yeah. we got this little block and I don't even know how much a yoga block costs because we have one and we've had it for so long. My wife bought it and we've had it for so long. I forgot how much it costs. Right. But I promise it probably ain't much more than 20 bucks. But now compare that to briefs and all the other things that you use for powerlifting. Mm -hmm. How much money they saw. I'm saying you could probably spend about three, four hundred dollars on uh, 
rehab type pre-workout, you know what I mean, mobility tools. Or they got a block. The simplistic nature. Yeah, they've solved this problem, but we don't know about the solution because yeah. we don't pay attention to them because how many of your audience follows yoga people? Yes, uh, right? And There's so not three plates why, on there. How can I follow exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> and that's why our magazine is like that because I'm like, the purpose of a magazine is to show you things that can help you in your fitness journey, whether you know about them already or not. Yeah. That's how I found out about the Juggernaut Method. I was reading Muscle Fitness Magazine. I didn't know what the Juggernaut Method was. But I needed a way to systemize my training before I ended up with a coach. And even now that I'm not competing in powerlifting, I still have a system that I used. And I was explaining it to my son when we, uh, before we started this, uh, the interview, when we just came on the call. I have a system that I use for putting together my training. And I've been using it since, well, since I found out about the juggernaut method. The juggernaut method, right? I would never have found out about that if not for a magazine. Mm. Maybe I would have found out about it because I'm on social media, I'm into powerlifting, but how much other stuff is out there that you'd never find out about because it's outside and they've solved problems that you don't even know are out there, yeah. but it's outside of what you already know, like, and follow. And it's up to storytellers like me to come talk to these people and say, hey, how'd you solve that problem when you, you're in your home gym? How'd you solve that problem? Oh, well, I did this and this. And they think it's simple. In fact, a lot of times they think it's so simple, they can't understand why you want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Like, nobody's interested in that. I'm like, well, actually, kind of, there's like this whole group of people here like this. Yeah. <laughs> <All right? laughs> they're scribbling stuff down. Like, really? Okay. okay. Maybe those are the people that actually have got, uh, got the right idea. The ones that yeah. are taking the ones that are taking the notes and the, and the, like that, I've always found that interesting. The, the, the ones who were never, or, or felt that they had already had enough information, that's really when you start to fall the off. The experts. Yeah. yeah. The you experts know, and all that. Well, you know, where it's, it's I mean, here's what I do, you know, or. In my or, experience. Right. Instead of, <laughs> instead of saying, hey, even if you don't agree with it, just say, hey, that's a, that's a different way to look at it. I've never thought of it that way. Try oh, it. Exactly. What's the worst try that's going to happen? Try you, it. You try it and you say, mm, not for me. And then you move on. But if it works Dude. for somebody else, but then, but then like somebody might come to you and say, Hey, have you ever heard of this method? Yeah, I have. I gave it a shot. I didn't like it, but go check out so-and-so because they're actually really good at it. Like that's, that's the way it yeah. should be done. Okay. Let's talk about dynamic stretching. This is just another, um, for some reason, I'm thinking about, I just left the chiropractor, so I'm thinking about mobility work. So dynamic stretching, right? It's like, all right, well, when do you put the dynamic stretching into your workout? You got to put dynamic stretching in there. Um, you don't want to do ballistic, but you want to do some dynamic stretching. Mm -hmm. Plus, you need to do some static stretching. Plus, you need to, uh, oh, we also got to have some sort of conditioning component, right? And for thousands of years, martial artists have just been kicking, which makes you tired, so it's conditioning, and it stretches you. <laughs> So on this one hand, we've got bands and circles and stuff to yank you this way and stuff to sh squish you this way. You know, like voodoo floss. And, and I'm not knocking anybody's stuff. I'm just saying there's voodoo floss bands to compress you this way. Then you got the hip circled up. So you can go back this way. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, then you got to, then let's time this in here and this do good. Okay. And I, I mean, I buy stuff too, but I'm like, yeah, okay. Except for like, there's like some temple full of monks in China and all they do is kick. Yeah. Which is free. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's I'm just a, like, that's, that's a what I mean. right there. <laughs> it's free. Yeah. And that's all I want to do with people is just say, hey, look, you may hate reading, but that's to your detriment because the secrets of the universe are locked up in a book somewhere mm. or mm -hmm. maybe in multiple books, right? The answers have been written down because over the centuries, the human being have the millennia, the people, human beings have been on this planet people have come up with solutions to things and they wrote those solutions down. And sometimes those solutions have been passed down multiple times before somebody said, Hey, you know, we might want to write this down. Yeah. And you're trying in your, let's say, and this is typically people who've only been training for like five years or less, right? In your five years of experience, you want to limit what you know about the human body and how to, how to express human performance to what you're able to find out in the, I'll be generous. Five hours a day, you can devote to learning about it 
in the five years that you've been doing it. Mm. What's wrong with you? No, no, that's, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, that's a great way to put it. And there's, uh, it was, uh, it was Jim Rohn who had said, he, he talked about r the importance of reading the, uh, wisdom of the world available, the wisdom of the world available, you know, and at that time he was talking about the importance of going to a library, but right, I mean, right. you don't even, you don't even need to do that now. And, and if, if you know the keywords to search, you can find just about any book. There's yeah. the audio books. I mean, one of the big books that's changed me was uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, yeah. which is, I mean, that's, yeah. that's probably uh, on the top list for most people, I would say. So yeah. um, if there's- Magic a, of Thinking Big is also another Yes, one. yeah. I haven't read that one yet. I need to read that one. And uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. Those are two that are on my list. So I haven't um, read Richard's Man of Babylon. Magic of yeah. Thinking Big, though, I love because it's just like you got to stop thinking small. Right. Also, uh, I just recently reread and I actually gave it as a gift to my youngest son. He's 16. A Message to Garcia. That's about initiative. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's a pamphlet, man. It's 17 pages. People tell me, oh, I hate reading. I'm like, dude, I read A Message to Garcia when First Sergeant Sullivan was wanted to put me up for meritorious sergeant. And he said look over your promotion package before I send it off. And I was like, all right. I looked it over. He said, make sure everything's correct. I looked at it. And I said, well, the only thing that's wrong for a sergeant is I haven't read a message to Garcia. It's on the commandant's reading list. I said, I haven't read a message to Garcia. He said, well, your first sergeant says you have. He handed it to me and pointed at a chair. <laughs> and that's how I read it. And I read it. I mean, I read fast anyway, but seriously, less than 30 minutes, yeah. 17 pages. Yeah. And th that, that, the lessons from that book have stuck with me. So yeah, again, it's, that was another thing that was outside my field of vision. I never would have read a message to Garcia. Yeah. If I saw it on a bookshelf somewhere or just whatever, I'm not going to read that. What is that? How would you even know? How would you yeah. even know? Yeah, that's incredible. Um, what, uh, are there any other books that you would recommend <clears throat> or any podcasts that you would recommend, things that have helped you along the way? Well, um, so I'm, I mentioned Mark Bell's power. It depends on what it is you're trying to develop. So mm -hmm. I, I watched the Marvel's podcast because I was trying to become better as an, better, um, a better interviewer. Uh, because I, I told you that I was trained as a journalist, but that was the, the bias was towards um, the idea is that they expect you to be interviewing people who don't want to talk to you. So politicians, maybe athletes, you know, whatever. Not, I don't mean athletes like who I talk to now, but I'm talking about like, uh, basketball players, football players, they're expecting that you're trying to get them. So they're very hesitant to talk to you. What I needed was practice at getting people to talk to me uh, who wanted to share their story, but who were shy, right? And so oh, I watched that to watch how they did it. Uh, I just thought it was funny. I mean, like, for example, one of their, their standard things was you <laughs> I, I don't do this, but one of the things they said to like relax the guests is like, hey, you got any good poop stories? I'm like what? <laughs> yeah, you got any stories? Because I mean, you know, like think about it. Like how many times, okay. I don't really want to know the answer to this, okay? But how many times have you gotten ready to go squat and you got to go to the bathroom? Hmm. Right? You're like, oh, this is not a good time to squat because <laughs> you're going to press that, you know, you're going to brace, bad things going to happen. Uh -huh. So. They immediately, like, like every lifter's been in this situation. You got any good poop stories, right? And so normally people do what you just did. You laughed. And it relaxes you. That's all oh, that. That's a good thing. So inject some humor in there, just mm -hmm. whatever. Like, even when, even, like, I was talking about the dude digging in his ear, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's a, it breaks the ice. Yeah. And so I watched it for that. Uh, so I would say, number one, figure out what it is you're trying to get better at. And then you want to go look at people who are already doing it. All right, so that's a general recommendation. As far as books, I would recommend to kind of unharness your mind from the social media trap. Um, if you were into lifting, there's a book called Physical Culture Simplified by Mark H. Berry. He was the first man, he, well, they only had male weightlifters on the Olympic team, but he was the first US Olympic team weightlifting uh, coach. So he coached the first U.S. Olympic weightlifting team. Um, and he coached it for several years. 
And that book has a, a quote. I know, uh, I, don't, I know you didn't ask me about quotes, but um, a, a quote that's in there that has affected me since I read it is the trained athlete can move with complete freedom in any direction at any time. Mm. How do we go from that to athletes at the top of, the, of their specific sport not being able to move certain ways? I can't reach that. I got to have a longer bar because I can't get my arms back in position. Yeah. Right? And these are people right. who are very, very strong. If you look at some of the things they could do, they just may not have been doing the same lifts we do because those lifts, I mean, like the bench press wasn't invented yet. Yeah. Right? But these are people who are ridiculous. I mean, Arthur Saxon could do a bench press with 300 plus pounds. That's one hand. All right? So they're not weak by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, if you watch uh, the, the show Strongest Man in History, that's another good one. I recommend go back and watch it on the history channel strongest man in history. And they go back and look at some of these older feats of strength. And then you just, yeah, it's great watching the modern guys do it, but imagine, you know, somebody, the guy who originally did it yeah. without the advantage of modern, whatever, and who's able to do it. Right. Um, so Mark H. Very physical training simplified. Um, I highly recommend just as a book in general, Shibumi is called, uh, called Shibumi is by Trevanian. When I, when I interviewed Dan John, he also recommended uh, Beowulf because, and that's more important to me now that I'm getting older because that's all about the hero's journey and about Beowulf. And at the very end, you see how Beowulf is still committed to living to his principles, even though he's at an age when most people would say, well, you're the king and you should just stay back. Don't do anything. And instead he decides to go out and face that dragon because I'm the king, I'm the hero. It's my job to go do this. It doesn't matter if I die or, pe or you think I'm too old to do it. The fact is the dragon needs to be faced. And obviously I need to go do it because instead of you all taking care of it, you came and told me. Mm -hmm. So that means I got to go take care of it. Right. Right. Um, and then uh, there's another one. If you want to read a more modern sort of version of that, you can read um, Legend by David Gemmel. Uh, his last name is G-E-M-M-E-L-L. -L. That's a fiction book. But it tells, you know, the same sort of stories. Like, a, this is a warrior whose people will consider past his prime. And he's like, look, you know what? I'm going to die well. I don't care that it may hurt. I don't care that I'm, I got my aches and my pains. This is a battle that needs to be fought. And no, apparently nobody else can do it because the enemy still exists. All of you all saw the enemy, and he's still there. So, obviously, it must be up to me. So those are, I guess, three that I would say just start with. Yeah, love it. That's great. Um, so as we wrap up here, I always end the, the podcast with uh, two questions. So give me your, uh, your first, the, the first word or phrase that comes to your mind when you hear the word strength. Ability. Okay, good. Um, I used to say to people, and I still say sometimes, that the fundamental thing about anybody thinks when they meet you, even if they don't say it, is who are you and what can you do? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't, I'm not necessarily talking about how much you can squat. It's like, how, I, that's, that's essentially asking, how are you useful? Yeah. I, I, I always refer to the phrase sometimes, what have you done for me lately? Like that's the kind of world that we yeah. live in. People will, it is. people will forget about what you've done yesterday because it doesn't matter. So what can you do for me today? That, uh, but the, I also think that's a good question to ask yourself absolutely. every day. Absolutely. Who are you and what can you do? Yeah. And that well, to me is strength. Yeah. What makes you valuable? Yeah. Yep. How about uh, leadership? Service. Yes. Servant. Very good. Yeah. Servant. Um, I can't ask you to do something if you, if I'm not willing to do it myself or I haven't done it myself. Mm -hmm. And that's the essence of leading is, I did it first. So if I'm leading you somewhere, I walked there first. Yeah. You drive animals or you can lead them, but it's just like, uh, if I'm, so it's like a dog. So if you see somebody walking a dog and the dog's in front, who's leading? Yeah. The dog's walking right? you, not the other way around. Exactly. Yeah. So when I walk my dog, the dog's in front because I'm leading. Right. Yeah. So I just say, uh, yeah, to me, leadership is I'm, yeah. I'm serving you because I'm showing you the way to go. 
I'm helping, I'm taking you somewhere I think you need to go. I'm serving you in that way. Yeah. And I'm putting myself, I'm also putting myself, making sure that I'm the first to face the danger. Any danger inherent in it, I'm letting you know it's safe. Yeah. There's just so much wrapped up in it, especially since I'm a dad. Yeah. And I'm a husband and a father. It's like, that's what leadership is, it's yeah. service. Yeah. And I, I've heard uh, Simon Sinek and, and John Maxwell talk a lot about servant leadership. Yeah. And that that's so Didn't, important. One of them wrote a book called Servant Leadership, right? Was it? John I believe Maxwell. it was, yeah, I was, believe it's Maxwell. He's, he's yeah. written like 70 or 80 books. So he's, <laughs> if anybody knows it, it would be him without a doubt. So, Oh, Hey, got another book recommendation. Yeah. Andy Stanley, the principle of the path. Okay. Yes. Andy Stanley, the principle of the path. Okay. He just talks about finding your path and how to, um, if this is the way I'm supposed to go, not getting, there'll be shiny stuff all over the place. Right. Like, so there are a lot of good things, but that may not be the appropriate thing for your path. Right. Glad right. For good. Um, so as we kind of close here, <laughs> this is uh, your opportunity for your shameless plug. So oh, sure. people want to want to get, get more information about you, follow you. Where do they go? How do they do it? Talk about the magazine. All right. Um, so... The, the Home Gym Quarterly is the only magazine in the world that's written by and for home gym owners. One of the criteria that I have whenever we started the magazine was I refuse to let anybody come on to tell us how to do something that they don't know how to do themselves. Again, that goes back to my principle of leadership. Mm -hmm. And we are committed to helping you uh, along your fitness journey. And we do that by informing you and inspiring you. And that goes across all of the things that we do from our YouTube channel, where we show home gym tours, from around the world, uh, like we've got a, one of the most inspiring ones is this guy from India has a rooftop gym and he's dealing with monsoon rains and everything, but he's still working out, right? Mm -hmm. So we do that from, from things like that to do-it-yourself builds to interviews with the people who influence the things that you use and do. So we talk to coaches, we talk to equipment manufacturers like you did with the Mars bar. Right. I think it's important to understand the philosophy behind some of these things because that's going to help you understand whether it's right for you. And then, of course, our magazine. Our magazine is designed to show you things that will help you in your fitness journey, whether you know about them already or not. If you'd like to write for the magazine, send an article pitch to john at garageandlikemedia.com. If you just like to check out all the things that we do, we welcome you if you're a home gym owner or if you're just thinking about uh, getting a home gym, just go to garagegymlifemedia.com and you'll see options to just click on um, to take you to uh, either YouTube, Instagram, or our magazine or our, our apparel store too. Um, I don't really promote the apparel store a whole lot because I'm just not good at sales. But for me, sometimes just the right t-shirt, like I said, motivates you to mm -hmm. get down in the gym and, and work out. Um, and the thing is that every bit of that money goes to me paying writers um, because I want to have quality in, in our magazine and we keep the magazine free. I mean, I get the money for the magazine from advertisers, the people who, to me, it's like the people who make the stuff that they're trying to sell you ought to make it possible for you to learn and continue your fitness journey. They owe that to you. And so I go to the advertisers who can serve the home gym community and I try, I get the money for the magazine from them because they owe it. And then also, again, hey, how do you know when your basement floods, you're going to need to know who to go to to get your basement gym, you know, protect your basement gym equipment, right? right? So I'm like, hey, give me a basement flooding person. Let's put an ad in this magazine for that. You know what I mean? Anyway, that was my very long plug, but I appreciate everybody who checks it out. And if you're just too tired to do all that, just go to me on Instagram at Garage and Life Media. Yeah, they're great content. I would I would highly suggest you you go check it out if you haven't done so yet, and you'll find some really good stuff. Great content. So great great interview, man. I appreciate the time. We didn't Thanks, even get man. to cover everything, and I still wanted to. <laughs> I know there's 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 still uh, like I really wanted to get into faith, but that I mean, holy cow, that could take another hour and a half. So we'll have to dive back into that one because there's a lot of stuff that you and I have talked with uh, in, in the past about faith-based stuff. So that's stuff. That I can tell can you that to. in a nutshell, my faith statement for right now is I am who I am because Christ did what he did. And how I honor that is 100% my utmost for his highest in everything. Amen to that. 
Absolutely. So, so that'll be a, that'll be a conversation for another day down the road. But uh, nonetheless, so well, John, I appreciate the time, man. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me and letting me ramble. Appreciate it. It was fun. Hey, it was it was a good time, brother. So we'll talk again soon. Yeah, man. Later. All right, buddy. See you later. See you.